All right, we got some juicy patch notes here. Version 1.2.0 for Total War Warhammer 3 is about to launch. If you're watching this video right when it goes live, I believe the patch comes out like three, four hours after the fact. Let's go through the quick spark notes here that Creative Assembly has laid out for us. Here's what this patch includes. The first Regiments of Renown pack, which adds elite troops to the campaign and battles. That is coming for free, That you just get that. Mounts now automatically unlock for all mounted characters, no skill points necessary. So meaning when you hit their actual level, you just get the mount, which is a really cool quality of life improvement. Auto resolve fixes for key campaign issues identified over the first months of Warhammer 3. So Auto resolve will now go off of the battles difficulty, not the games difficulty. And it will scale too, depending on the difficulty you've selected. So it's kind of nice there. AI improvements to address concerns with siege battles and overbearing anti-player bias. Numerous improvements to unit responsiveness during battles. Technology updates and more for every playable race. And a long list of fixes for campaigns and battles based on player feedback and more. So those are the quick down and dirty notes here for 1.2. We're about to get into the deep of this, but that's kind of all you wanted to know about 1.2 as far as like, oh, it's a general overview of what's coming. That's all you need to know. You can go on and head on out. And but before you do, please don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe. But for those that want to stick around for the nitty and gritty, let's get going here. We'll scoop on down. This just kind of tells you how to do this if you're on the Microsoft Store, on Steam, on Epic, whatever it is. It shows you how to download this um patch but now we start off with the regiments of renown and let's go into them here so the first one is the dune dragons and this is kind of very similar to what we've already gotten with the high elves and with the lizard men it's basically a unit of celestial dragon guard that have magic halberds magic resistance and they also give encourage so they, uh, they have all that going for them. They'll also, of course, be the uh, the max rank, so they'll all get those corresponding buffs to their stat lines, uh, as all of the regiments are now will. The next one is the Hellforged Host, which is a regiment renowned Exalted Bloodletter of Corn, which basically just has heavier armor. The Zarg Guard with great weapons, Draz's Hearth Blades, uh, have flaming attacks. And it looks like they do have a little bit of fiery animation on there. If we can look at that picture right there... I don't really see the rest of it having very many fire particles on it, so I'm not sure if they're like flaming like we see with uh, uh, the Bretonian monks who have the flaming and magic weapons, but they do have flaming attacks, which will help out with fighting regenerating foes, which these festering stooges, the exalted plague bearers of Nurgles, uh, will have. <laughs> Healing over time and restoring their number through defensive abilities, this unit represents the pinnacle of Grandfather Nurgles and during uh, infantry. So probably will have innate regen and a defensive capability to resurrect any units in the unit, <laughs> any models in the unit. Next, we have the Powder Gut. These uh, Powder Guts, these are man-eaters with ogre pistols. And... Um, it basically says that they've got the finest armory, right, of, of Nolan, but firing faster with greater range and accuracy, these ogres are a significant threat to armored foes. So they'll probably have their innate AP because they are uh, pistols, but it makes me think they might have an increased damage profile, and they've got a, long, a, a longer range and a faster firing rate, which is kind of nice here for them. The bringers of beguilement are exalted demonettes of Slanesh, and uh, they will have perfect vigor as well as rampage, and enrapturing the weak wield with their rampage contact effect, which should be pretty interesting to see how these work. They'll basically be able to lock something down uh, and chase things down because they'll also be exalted demonettes, which are going to be moving quite quick with perfect vigor. Blazing squealers are exalted pink horrors of Slanesh as well here. Um, they will have the warp uh, delivering devastating range fire via their warp flame projectiles, the Blazing Squealers also provide nearby friendly units with more ammunition, making them an excellent linchpin for any Zinchian host. So that'll be pretty spicy to see how that plays out for Zinch, making those horrors even more disgusting. The multiplayer leaderboard has also been completely reset to kind of take, in, uh, take advantage a lot of the rebalancing that's happened in 1.1 and in this new coming patch 1.2. For the game, we have some stability performance uh, improvements here fix an issue where occupying a settlement with a loaned army could cause the game to crash or freeze and a soft lock when entering Slanesh's realm to collect the final soul and then passing the turn also we could improve the performance impact of shadow splits and the at the and the distance at which trees are culled um 
and for cinematics, fix an issue where Boris Ursus' intro movie would fail to unlock in the movie viewer. If you have already unlocked him, you can start a new campaign with Boris to unlock the movie. Now for gameplay improvements, again, we get the mount skills auto unlock. So when you ever you reach that respective rank, you just get the mount, which I absolutely love. Now for the auto resolve, this is going to be pretty huge for everyone who plays. So the outcome outcome is now determined by the battle difficulty setting rather than the campaign difficulty setting, which I think is... Uh, a little more appropriate and then the difficulty scaling of auto resolve has been reduced on hard and higher difficulty settings so anyone who plays on hard very hard or legendary it's gotten a better i guess it's got a rework it was a better scaling there um, and this should result in less punishing outcomes on higher difficulty settings allowing more time for you to focus on the fights that really matter in your campaign for glory we will continue monitoring the behavior of auto resolve and making adjustments in future builds i'm very curious to see how this works because as is the current state we all know this that you have to fight pretty much every single battle or else you're just going to lose a staggering amount of things that you didn't want to lose so i'm very curious to see how this goes so certain armies benefit from better auto resolve than others and i'm wondering if they've kind of tweaked that as well so i'm very very curious to see that for ai behavior we've increased the aggression levels of ai players which should make them more inclined to initiate siege attacks against settlements significantly tone down the anti-player bias in the ai's target selection especially on higher difficulties the ai should now be less inclined to deploy forces over significant distances to engage the player if they are not perceived to be a particular threat the wood elves should be more focused on defending their capital city so these improvements should not only help them play a more meaningful role in your campaigns but will prevent them from developing an anti-player bias where you, uh, when you aren't the immediate threat so an example of this would probably be playing boris ursus where you are beset on all sides by skaven on the southwest ogres in the east ogres in the north and then any kind of other skaveny destruction and other uh, vampire counts to the southwest as well they should kind of have a better I, I think you'll still deal with threats from the southwest but the ogres to the north should probably deal a little bit more with the dwarfs and with nurgle and less so with you because they're a more immediate threat than you are now for unit responsiveness we get some good juicy increases here we've made several adjustments let's read through those range units will now correctly rotate and fire when ordered to shoot a target behind them range units should now reform properly after rotating to engage targets behind them and resolved issues which would result in units ignoring orders and becoming unresponsive for the short periods of time oh Oh, that one, that one made me shudder. It was so good. Uh, resolved issues which would prevent flying units from attacking single entity land units. Reduce the delay before ranged units can fire a volley. Reduce the delay before ranged units can respond to issued commands after firing a volley. Removed transition animations used by iron hail gunners and armored cossars, which resulted in an overall reduction in their damage per second. That's that's lovely because they were, felt really clunky. There's also increased the responsiveness when ordered to move after firing a volley and implemented a partial fix for instances where units engaged in battle would ignore player issued retreat orders and instead re-engage in melee combat. We will continue to identify and make improvements in future releases. I mean, that's also been a problem for ages with Total War, not even Total War Warhammer. I, I think it's been particularly bad in Total War Warhammer, right? Especially when you have a single uh, model or two that just kind of gets stuck in a, in a, in a, far-flung portion of the combat and then it just keeps the whole unit there so i would love to see them fix that properly because i've just i've seen it in medieval 2 we we just reviewed that on the channel and they had plenty of those unit responsiveness issues not nearly as bad as 3 warhammer 3 but still it's something that the game has struggled with for a long time so I, I, it's cool to see an actual patch note on it how it actually plays out i guess we'll see manual fire uh not to be confused with manual uh cooldowns when using the manual fire mode should now mirror the timings of regular battle and re-enabled manual fire in multiplayer settings because what was happening was people would shoot a volley let the game shoot a volley pop into manual mode fire and the game would be about ready to fire again so the game would fire naturally then you pop back into manual mode so you basically rapid fire something so this has been toned down and fix an issue which will result in plagues failing to be removed properly after changing ownership of and subsequently losing an afflicted army and players will no longer receive achievements for recruiting greater demon units while playing as the demon prince rather they must now be recruited when playing as the respective god's faction interesting enough 
for faction balances here. Uh, when previewing parts, the stats of the Demon Prince now properly consider army effects in the calculation, which is good because it's always been kind of wonky. The switchable plagues rollout button is no longer available when it's not the player's turn, and fixing issue prevented the final options in the Demonic Glory Tree from unlocking. I'm not going to go through every single one of these uh, because it's, there's quite a bit here, of course. Um, but you can see that there is quite a bit of improvement to the chaos, the, the the demons of chaos, the the, uh, um, the demon prince here, namely, moved the ten percent physical resistance granted by the demon prince's default demon head and added it to its base stats. They should now align with the twenty percent base physical resistance of all demons. So you got a little bit of a, a stability buff there. With Grand Cathay in update one point one, we took. We took the first steps to increase the performance of Cathay overall, but we felt it was necessary to take additional measures with niche units that haven't quite solidified their place in the roster. A special note are the Crane Gunners, which are now looking to push beyond the power level of the Warplock Gisales. This change comes at a higher price point, however, to clearly indicate their quality. The other units... The other unit receiving some much requested and much needed changes is the Wu Jing War Compass. Sharing the Winds of Magic Pool with their caster character is awkward, and we recognize that does that doing so doesn't work as well in our game as we'd like. As such, the mount now provides two charges of each spell for free to compensate. However, we weaken the version of the Celestial Comet spell available to the unit. I kind of felt like that should have been the way that the game approached it to begin with. It should have just been a free charge. Um, we, we see that re represented in so many other units that just get a free charge. Very rarely do they ever pull from the Winds of Magic. So it was an interesting design choice to go with that, to go with a full, a full strength Winds of Magic costing spell versus a, uh, a reduced strength charge. So interesting to see that. Units, though, across the board, Celestial Dragon Guard and Crossbowmen have had their points reduced by 50 gold. Crane Gunners have had their AP jumped up from 30 to 35, and they'll now penetrate infantry targets, which is pretty spicy. Improved the overall accuracy of the unit as well, but they've gotten a massive 300-point hike. The Fire Rain Rocket has dropped 100 points, and the Great Longbow Riders have gone down in points as well. Jane Lancers have gotten an increase to their charge, which should make them a lot more viable, because right now they feel a little too papery for me. Wu Jing War Compass 2 has had a 150-point increase, but it's, um, oh, it cost the Ashramancer Mount increase from 400 to 600 as well, and we know about its two, its double charges thing, right? Uh, Zhao Ming and Multiplayer Warding Iron is now provided as a free passive ability, which is just spicy. So a lot of improvements here to every single little thing, a lot of uh, technology swaps and changes for Cathay, right? So they've changed a lot of them and then they've added more, right? So Alchemist, Com uh, Alchemist Compact, uh, Hero Action Success Chance plus 8% for Alchemists or Powder Mixing Recruit Rank plus 3 for Fire Rain Rocket Units, uh, Upkeep Reduction of 10% for Yang Armies with the Right of Yang. So a lot of really good additional technologies being brought in here for Cathay, things that I think were absolutely needed because Grand Cathay's technology tree was very underwhelming in my opinion. So good to see a lot of these being brought in and, and kind of spicing stuff up like your Lord recruitment stuff, recruitment rank, uh, Lord, hero and Lord recruitment rank here, wins of magic power reserve, stuff like that. For corn, um, we get another bevy of changes here. They did say they didn't want to touch corn much in 1.1, uh, but in 1.2, they wanted to do some passes after things kind of uh, the dust settled, as it were. The key changes affect the skull crushers, who will now gain a bonus versus large units advantage to set them apart from blood crushers. Also worth noting are the gore beast chariots, which are getting a much needed increase to their mass, so it can be more effectively utilized as chariots. So we'll see them being a little bit spicier. The corn's glare, unholy manifestation, fix an issue which result in players' capital being raised if the target army was destroyed during the active period. That has now been fixed. <laughs> um, but a lot of point changes here as, as well for the bloodthirsters. Dropping down in points, cultists going up in points, Gorby's chariots going up in points significantly. Don't mind that noise. My brown rice has now completed its cooking process. And that's probably one of the more annoying things to let it be known that my brown rice is done. If you can hear that, I can. But I'm just going to keep going through these patch notes. <laughs> Gorby's chariots defense has gone up by three, attack up by five as well. A nice buff to them. The skull cannon has had a bit of a tweaking as well. Its health has been increased. Its base weapon damage has been increased. And then its cost reduced by 50 as well as oh that's skull crusher sorry now enjoy uh, the skull crusher now get a plus 10 bonus versus large benefit which is cool here so a lot of um 
lot of shoring up for corn, right? Making the two things that I think in the, in the list stood out as being a little more insignificant with the Gore Beasts and the Skull Cannons being a little too thin, paper thin, uh, getting, giving them a nice little buff around is a pretty good little uh, ability here. Herald of Corn, increase the multiplayer cost of Locus of Wrath from 50 to 200 gold, which is a significant jump. And the Minotaurs of Corn have had their costs reduced uh, pretty significantly here uh, for 150 for the standard variation. And what is that, 250? That's another 150 here for their uh, great weapon of uh, variation. <clears throat> Technology, a bunch of changes here, but then a bunch of additions as well. Um, pretty much everything that's changed has been an increase, so nothing has been... Well, I don't see yeah, I don't see any really major buffs, or uh, uh, I'm sorry, debuffs here. Uh, and then we have a bunch more technologies added. I actually really like the technology tree for corn because I think it's so strong with the ability to basically repopulate things. But getting an update, uh, upkeep reduction for the blood hosts in multiple iterations I think is crucial because those blood hosts do end up tanking your overall economy and it's nice to see that those will be added here. At least right here get 10% just from those two, which is pretty nice. Um, Hit point increase though of 10%, which is pretty pretty sexy. Skulls gained from kills 50%. Skull thrown cost minus 20%. So a lot of great buffs here for corn. With Kislev, um, again, they wanted to kind of reassess certain things. We felt that given their excellent kiting capabilities, it would be appropriate to tone down their usefulness in melee. To compensate for this change, we are improving in the performance of some other units slightly, as well as some of the less prominent spells. Uh, they're talking about these sleds, by the way, as far as what they've what they've kind of nerfed for their combat capabilities. And we see that represented here. The heavy war sled has had its mass reduced um, down by a whole thousand points and its AP weapon damage reduced quite a bit here as well. And the range has been decreased from 140 to 130. The Ice Guard, though, have gotten a reduction in cost, and the Light War Sled has had the same kind of treatment that the Heavy War Sled had. But we do get a nice increase to the Griffin Legion, getting an armor buff of 10 and a reduction in points by 50. And the War Bear Riders here getting more armor from 95 to 100 and a melee defense from 32 to 34, which is pretty spicy here as well. Also, I do really like that Zar Guard improvement on the Great Weapons from 32 to 36. That's going to be represented with the new Regiment Renown as well, which is pretty nice. Um... I was looking at this. Uh, when when Boris has unlocked the dilemma offering settlements, will now take into account which settlement the player already owns to prevent the display of invalid. Okay, I was like, oh, that's a good thing. I, I I totally forgot about that because it's like it'll be like, hey, do you want to give him prog? It's like, I don't own prog. Sure, take it. <laughs> so abilities here, the multiplayer costs of the following patriarch abilities have an increase from 150 to 200. So Daz's Song of Winter Sunlight, Salyak's Lullaby, which is of course the heal, and Tor's Battle Hymn have all had a 50 point increase. And then for the spells, we got a very nice reduction for the Winds of Magic on Crystal Sanctuary, but then Ice Maiden's Kiss gets a, a DPS increase from 16 to 18 and 32 to 36. Blizzard will get its DPS increase too from 3 to 4 and 6 to 8 on its respective versions. And then lastly, Biting Wind will get a DPS increase from 24 to 26, 32 to 36, which should see um, the Lore of Ice getting a nice little uh, uh, damage buff there. Technology, of course, we get the same kind of treatment. A lot of changes here. Uh, we get also increasing stuff like breach loaders. Now also affects Kossars and Streltsy, which is really nice. Um, and then adding a bunch more uh, um, technology here. Always great. Armor piercing missile damage plus three for Kossars, armored Kossars, and Streltsy units with the breach loaders. So I do love this. The following technologies have the noted bonus added to their existing benefits. And I'm sorry, that's something I should have distinguished in these these are not new technologies it's made the existing technologies better i'm so sorry about that um this is the the first portion of it it says that it changed its original function and this is adding more to that function i didn't make that distinction in the in the beginning forays of this technology rampage but i do like to see that they're adding more stuff to the armored cossars and cossars because sometimes it was a little it was a little confusing right like Hooked Axe Blades now affects armored Kossar units in addition to Kossars. And that was, I think, one of the biggest shortcomings of Kislev is you'd get buffs to Kossars or buffs to armored Kossars and not to the opposite, and it didn't make any sense. So nice to see that you actually kind of had that shored up here. Um, moving into Nurgle, we can see a lot of technology changes here. Not a whole ton of changes. The unit costs have gone up and down a little bit. 
uh, reduce, reduce, and increase. The cultists go from 500 to 600, but the toads and plague riddens go from 650 to 600 and 1,000 to 250. Uh, but Kugoth also has access to Pestle Decay and multiplayer settings as well. And the Great Unclean One spells are now treated as abilities with one use each and no longer require Winds of Magic, which is a lovely little thing to do. Um, and then a bunch of changes and additions to those uh, respective technologies when you're playing in single player. Ogre Kingdoms have gotten a lot of changes. A lot of changes because one in, when the game first came out, they were just so strong. They were so strong. And 1.1 did hit them a little bit. So here's how 1.2 treats them. Greece, is, uh, we've been mostly happy with the state of the Ogres as 1.1, aside from a few outliers. Greece's performance in battle is as a forefront of our attention. We obviously expect our legendary lords to live up to their, their titles, so we've made some tweaks to his viability. Giants have also been underwhelming in most rosters for a long time. We want to give them a bit of a nudge with an added bonus to their missile resistance, which I think is a good call here. Man-eater ogre pistols, on the other hand, have been drastically overperforming when it comes to their ranged attacks, especially considering their potency in melee combat as well. So we're bringing this unit a bit more in line to achieve better balance for its hybrid nature. So we should see that kind of represented down here with a reduced to AP damage from 96 to 68. That is significant. And then their costs have been increased from 1400 to 1500 With the Giants, they now enjoy a 15% missile resistance, which I think is pretty nifty here. With Greece's Gold Tooth, increased AP damage from 405 to 455 And the more player cost for Horde Master has been reduced from 150 to 50 also a 200 point increase on the Stonehorn map for the Hunter here as well. Noblars also got a point increase from 200 to 250 um, well, as well. Abilities offers to the Great Maw can now be performed by armies at sea, which is pretty cool. Over Tyrant's Crown, increase the damages and bonus from 10% to 5%, which is significant. And then we get four little uh, changes around and additions for uh, some of the technologies for the Ogre Kingdoms. Uh, diplomatic relations with all factions, range for Iron Blasters, reload time reduction for Iron Blasters, which is quite nice, and weapon strength increase for Gorger units, which can only go well. So Nash is in an interesting place because it didn't get a whole ton of passes in 1.1. And in 1.2 here, we see quite a bit of stuff changing in the technology tree mainly. Mainly a lot of upkeep reductions, I think, which is very nice because you do have so many ways you can get access to units with Slanesh across their hosts and then the actual Slaneshi armies themselves. But with the units, we're going to be seeing a point cost reductions. You're only going to be seeing in multiplayer. So if you're watching and listening to stuff like a uh, multiplayer cost increase from 600 to 700. Again, like it says, it's only going to be with multiplayer. Uh, but increased melee attack from 30 to 40 with the Demoness of Slanesh, helping them hit more often. And Steed Mount now deals poison attacks as melee weapon contact effect for the Herald of Slanesh. And Spawn of Slanesh now enjoys the spor uh, soporific musk melee co contact effect, which I think is great. I think we got one other unit got it last patch too. So cool to see that rolling out more. Zinch, of course, is stupid strong. Stupid, stupid, stupid strong. Lastly, we're keeping a critical eye on blue horrors and multiplayer with a higher cost, given they are the most efficient basic infantry in the game. For 1.3, we're discussing whether we weaken the base units, example, less ammunition, while compensating for the loss via skill tree tweaks. So it will be very interesting to see how that plays out. Screamers got an increase in their armor from 20 to 30 and an increase in health from 4,100 to 4,600. And then there's cost reductions for the horrors and the zinch. And the blue horrors go up a whole 100 gold, which is pretty significant here. The Lord of Change gets the same thing that every single other greater demon has gotten with just abilities. Our spells treated as abilities rather than actual winds of magic spells. Then we have a bunch of... Uh, uh, Changes here to some technologies, as always. Lowered the upkeep bonus from 10% to 9%. Lowered the recruitment cost reduction from 10% to 9%. So a little bit of a nerf there with some technologies. Um, also, Thaumatic uh, Locus, almost said Focus, has an entirely new behavior. Winds of Magic Power Reserve Capacity plus 20. And then we also get some additional things brought into this. Uh, let's see, I think big ones. Casualty Replenishment Rate, which is one that people were, were saying is, is a pretty hard one. We got a a 5% bonus here onto Scatter Loci. Also, we get Missile Strength Increase for Flamers and Exalted Flamers. A Lord Recruitment Rank for Lore of Metal Casters. Recruitment for Doom Rank or Doom Knights. Recruitment Rank for Doom Knights <laughs> of Zinch units has been increased with Disc Taming. 
and then AP damage increase for blue horrors, pink horrors, and exalted pink horrors of six for exalted locus of conjuration, which is pretty <laughs> girthy here. Now into the campaign, there's been a ton of little changes here and there. If you're experiencing specific things that are barring you from playing, stuff that's really bothering you, please go through this list. A lot of them tend to be a little more nuanced situations like fix, fix an issue where skill previews would also include enemy effects. I don't know if I ever ran into that, but that has now been fixed. Um, fix an issue when enter where entering ambush stance below a portal will result in your army getting stuck beneath the teleporting army. So very specific niche circumstances that I different tip, I typically don't see myself running into. Uh, fix an issue where the Aaron port settlement would not transfer ownership properly when occupied. That's a pretty big one. Didn't never knew that one existed. But some stuff here with the prologue has been done, the realm of chaos and dilemmas, uh, diplomacy as well. Fix an issue where sending in a request to an AI player to break one of their alliances would have no effect. Um, but then for the battles, we have some general updates as well. So fix an issue which allowed AI players to ignore deployable deployables cooldowns when defending in battle. Fix an issue where tower projectiles would diminish in strength despite having been upgraded. Unbreakable units will no longer route when all victory points are captured. Updated the deployment zones and reinforcement logic lines in subterranean battles. Partially fixed issue where marauder horsemen would have trouble attacking defensive towers. Uh, something that I've actually experienced before. Destroyed artillery will no longer lose all of its ammunition. And fixed an issue which prevented artillery from being recruited after machine model, a machine model was destroyed. So if you're having issues with your artillery and it not being able to be either um, recruit or start shooting after being recruit, this has been hopefully fixed for you. Domination mode has also had a, a change to its passive income from 20 to 15 and increase the health penalty incurred following a teleport withdrawal from 20 to 50 percent. And that is pretty much it. That is that is the patch notes, guys. This is a girthy one. It, this is a this is a picture of them. So they have not gone live yet. There might be little things that they change before this goes live, like little uh, corrected typo stuff like that. So be on the lookout for the actual patch, which will hand, hit a handful of hours after this. You can go ahead and jump it, uh, get onto it from Epic, Steam, or from the Microsoft Store uh, if you're on Game Pass. This will give you a way to download that update. We'll be showing off those uh, regiments for now, probably in a stream later today, I imagine. Um, we'll just kind of see what they look like, kind of do some little testing here and there, maybe jump into a couple battles, look at a couple things, whatever it is. But it's cool to see the instruments of renown. Still want to see a lot of different stuff coming to the game, of course. But we all really want to see that uh, that Immortal Empires map and, and more information on a lot of the other things that, that should have come, have not come. Still want to see a lot of stuff in the future of Total War Warhammer 3, but go ahead and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Are you excited for this patch? Is this still some stuff that they, that they really haven't touched on that you really want them to hit on? Whatever it is, let it be known in the comment section below. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.